Welcome to Charts Chat for Tuesday, September 4th, 2018. Um, I'll start by putting in the agenda and meeting minutes into chat here. Uh, so now it's popped up on the right. And it looks like we've got four things listed uh, to talk about here. Um, release candidate versions on charts, uh, best practices for HPAs, should we still add missing charts owners files and trusted users and okay to test. Uh, I don't know if we have all the folks on who asked for this. So we can track any of them down real quick. So I think uh, Scott and a few others. Let's see, we'll, we'll give them a minute to join. The first one is a release candidate versions on charts. Uh, you'll see a pull request here. Oh, and I think it's my job. I got to get feedback on that. So what we were talking about with the release candidates on here, I think I forgot to give feedback. So what we were talking about when it comes to release candidates on charts, uh, and we talked about it in office hours last week, was if the chart has a release candidate version of the chart, so the uh, version as listed not the app version, but the version in the chart.yaml was a release candidate, then we would uh, allow for a release candidate image, but only in that capacity. And that's because we didn't want to have a stable release as a release candidate. In fact, I think it was my to do, my to do with, okay. So I just added it to my to-do list. Um, so that's what we had talked about during office hours. Do folks have questions on that? I, I imagine that somebody added it to uh, the chat because they weren't in office hours last week. Um, and I failed, I, I'll admit it, I failed to go put it on the issue. I'll do it right when this call's done. So the way Helm does things, uh, for those who don't know, is when you don't put a version in, it looks for the newest released version. And that's a version without a, um, without a pre-release on it. It basically uses the equivalent of star, just give me everything and give me the latest off everything, but it does appear to sort it to get the latest release when it does it. And so that's that's how it works things out, but it doesn't include pre-releases. I was supposed to go double check that, which I didn't, um, but I'll go do that and comment on the issue. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Um, I could be wrong because I wrote the library more than six months ago and anything you wrote that long ago might as well have been written by somebody else. Um, so there was that issue. Okay, uh, let me actually add a to-do. Yeah, if I remember the one issue with that was with requirements.yaml it would work because of December the, the way you d described a range but if you did just a helm install it would probably pick the RC version and I don't know if that's the helm install wouldn't either um, because okay. it uses this the asterisk and I think you have to have uh, a dash zero on the end if you wanted to pick up the RC version uh, oh, okay. I can look in that and, and maybe write it up somewhere yeah I think that would be good to have confirmed. Yeah. Okay. You know what I love? I love that, uh, even when I put my name in here in to-dos, that it always offers to assign it to Matt Butcher. I just love that Google Docs does that for me. All right, uh, I'll take that on um, and to document and to double check. Uh, the, I took this last time and I forgot. All right, I, I think, is there anything else on this one with release candidates? All right, uh, then there's best practices for, let's see, let me pull it up. For the horizontal pod autoscaler, um, is anybody on to talk to this? Looks like Scott. Looks like here. Scott. Yeah, put this one on. Please doesn't seem to be on. All right. Um, 
I just pinged him. We'll see whether he can join us or not. Uh, so the question he had is, um, what about best practices for uh, HPAs? It seems only stable Spark and stable Nginx Ingress define horizontal pod autoscaler and templates. Um, another chart has a reference to Replica's Max and its README, um, but it seemed to be a copy from Spark. There's no reference in the text. Uh, should we recommend bundling HPAs with charts as best practices or suggest instead using a standalone controller like uh, there's a HPA operator here? Um, so basically it's, since there's so little use of horizontal pod autoscaler, how should we bring this in to charts? And what should we tell folks to do with it? So typically we've, we've built best practices around what we see people doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a little hard to say here because we haven't seen much use of HPAs, but we could, you know, a start could be to take a look at what Spark and Nginx Ingress does and, and start putting together some sort of documentation around how you define that. Should people be using them? I'm, I'm going to say yes, we should probably have more of it. Um, and my guess is, is that it is a lack of understanding of what they are or how to use them that causes some of this problem, right? Um, what is the support out there in the wild from the various uh, Kubernetes platforms like? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, let's go look at the... Um, let's go see, how long ago did you... I, I think all of the, at least all, all of the compliant uh, services should support it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's V1, but how long has it been V1 for? It's actually, hold on. I'm going to see if I can grab the docs and go back. So it's been V1 uh, for every version of Kubernetes that's currently supported for any kind of security or bug fixes. And for, I think, whatever underlying version of Kubernetes is even used for OpenShift versions that are supported. So I'm talking N minus three releases of Kubernetes. So at least one eight. So it's been, and that's V1. Oh, let's see. I can only go to API docs back to one seven. Just let me go further than that. And it was V1 there. So it's been V1 for a long time. Right, so that's for the API, but the actual implementation in the back end, because I assume it requires um, metrics uh, and that sort of stuff to be able to be actioned on. So I'm thinking like, you know, ingress, the API is there, but not it's not always like enabled by default. And you have to put the Nginx ingress controller on there or whatever to make it actually work. So I'm just thinking of the API existing versus the actual platform functionality. Yeah, I think I think it. Well, there's different options for it, but I think you can. I think most of them by default are set up to use uh, just like the the CPU memory resources, resource usage, and, and act on that. Um, but you can also set up custom metrics. Uh, although I haven't really looked into how how, how that works. So you know, you know what yeah. I see here? I, I quite frankly I see Kubernetes is complicated and hard, and most folks don't read into it. And um, this is probably one of those things that's been out there for a long time because auto scaling is needed, but almost nobody really knows how to use it. And so I'm looking at this going, I know the basics. I know some people have used it, but I don't really do much with it myself. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, this might be a good thing for us to dig more into and start promoting and maybe find a way to go back to Kubernetes docs or other places to make it easy for people to figure out how to use and just one of those rough parts of Kubernetes. Of course, I'm probably putting my SIG apps hat on right now um, when I think about this, but this seems like one of those hard things. So I don't, 
I'm not comfortable writing best practices because I don't feel comfortable writing them. Um, but I think it's an area we should dig into more. So I, I wonder if our initial best practice should be that it should be uh, like toggleable and maybe off by default until mm -hmm. we understand the behavior more uh, across the various implementations of Kubernetes. Uh, especially if folks are wanting to use custom metrics that may not be in the, the default sort of basic Kubernetes API. Yeah. So I'm just looking at a docs and it says that uh, the metrics.kates.io API is usually provided by metrics server, which needs to be launched separately. Yeah. Um, although it can also fetch metrics directly from Heapster, but I, I'm not sure that every Kubernetes service um, sets up Heapster. So... Yeah, and I know there's been some issues with Heapster where some of the platforms have been lagging, so it doesn't quite work right because it's supposed to be HTTPS endpoint, and a lot of the times it's still on HTTP, so there's some issues when you actually run like kubectl top and stuff, and you've got to hit like an extra um, schema HTTP or HTTPS value to that. Uh, and so that's kind of why I'm thinking there might be uh, issues with it actually working versus the API being supported. The other one I see all the time is pod security policy, right? If you're using straight um, um, flannel, you don't actually get any security created by it. It says, yes, fine, but nothing actually happens. Um, and I think it's worse to have a default that thinks it did something but didn't really um, than to you know, make it something that you need to toggle on. Yep. So Paul, uh -oh. you, I, th I think I heard something in there about a best practice, such as um, it needs to be toggleable or uh, along the lines of, um, you know, maybe we go with what Kubernetes supplies by default and some details around what it means and where the problems are, some notes on it. Mm -hmm. Is that something you could craft up for our best practices doc? Oh, I see what you're doing there. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> That, that was a yes with an upwards inflection, which, which means that I, I, I will do it, but I wasn't, I was, wasn't planning on volunteering for it. <laughs> uh, it. It would be a place to start. The doc, by the way, is yeah. a review guidelines. Um, I've dropped a little link to it in there. If you want to put something in there, we could review it, maybe learn something ourselves and, and start to dig more into this. A pull request would be a good start though. And you seem to know more about it than I do. So oh, that's boy. why I, uh, yes, speak up. And next thing you know, somebody will be asking, do you want to volunteer for this? All right, cool. Do you want to put enough info in the to-do? And I will uh, sure. go ahead and make that happen. All right. Nice typing days off. Let's see what things do we want in there. Um, Toggleable. Um, you know, the part of the, some of this also gets into ideas that I've been starting to wonder about. So, so Kubernetes is becoming a layered environment, right? Where you get a basic core and then there's this whole idea of making everything extensible. And uh, in the extensible, um, with the extensible part, there's this idea that, right, Kubernetes has some core primitives, but now they're even talking about, right, with volumes doing snapshot of backups being an add-on and making everything new an add-on. Well, then you've got very little genericness and things that you can specify, right? But a lot of these things are add-ons and there's no distribution mechanism for them yet. Mm -hmm. Part of me says, you know what? Charts, because these are things you can just install after your Kubernetes cluster is up. And then you could mark them as dependencies in your chart to say, if this is installed, go use it, right? 
So I see an opportunity here for charts to be a way to distribute extensions and then even depend on them and their versions. Yeah. I so I see an opportunity here when it comes to some of this stuff and, and metrics and even metric server may be one of those ideas. I don't know. I'm just starting to think out loud of places we could go with this. Okay. All right. Anything else on this topic? Awesome, we're trucking along through this. All right, should we still add missing chart owners files? I think this was another Scott one, if I remember right. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so there were a whole bunch of charts without them. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we probably should try to move towards that model. Uh, yeah, but we need to make sure that folks are trusted before we add them into owner's files, right? Yes. Yep. The same way as... In fact, we probably need, since we don't have the Kubernetes, this even gets into the next one. So I would say, yes, we do, as long as they're trusted and we can prove they're trusted. Uh, what What does that mean to you? Is it, can we not assume that people who have contributed a chart before are trusted or...? Well, not all chart people, people who are listed as chart maintainers uh, have actually contributed. Many of them, there'll be like three people at a company and one person contributed the chart and the other two haven't done any contributions, hmm. but that one person carries it along, but their name was thrown in when it was originally contributed. And so we have lots of cases where people are listed as maintainers of a chart who haven't touched it. We've got a number of those cases. Yeah, I would say we probably only want to add folks who have actually committed and therefore sign the CLA. Uh, we're on DCO now. Yeah, but they probably signed the CLA at some yeah, point. <laughs> that's true. Um, but or yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, as I said in the comment, I, I would like to help. I just need to know which charts and so on. Cool, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what the best approach to go and do this is. Presumably, you want a separate PR for each. We, I, I guess we also need approval from the person we're adding as an owner because they will be bugged automatically. Yeah, we should we should chat with them to make sure. Um, because yeah. some folks may be like, you know, I'm actually not doing anything with that anymore, so yeah. please don't do it, and their name should be removed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this something that will also clean itself up a little bit when we get the distributed search happening and allow people to be hosting their own. Yeah. So maybe we could just kind of sit on it and let all that uh, wash out and see what happens. Um, that could be option. And another way of going about this, it would be to just ha like rather than, you know, proactively doing it, just, just waiting for um, chart maintainers to add, go and add them themselves. And then yeah. we just prove it. It's just it's just getting that message across, though, that that chart maintainers can go and do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe as we're seeing contributions from people, um, we can ask through multiple things. We can say, "Hey, do you are you interested in becoming?" And that way, you'll have a much easier uh, go of keeping this up to date. Um, yeah, that might... I've I actually think... done that. So yeah. if somebody is like saying blah, but I need a repo maintainer to plus one it and I know that they're capable, I'll be like, hey, how about an owner's file? Here's where it can be documented. Are you cool with it? And then getting them on board. I like look for those opportunities because then I know that there's somebody else who could be bugged instead of myself or one of the other maintainers to review these things. Yeah, that might be a better way to go about it actually. There's a question here at the bottom about whether this list should include deprecated charts. Um, and I would I think, say no. Yeah, yeah. Given, given that we removed the maintainers from deprecated charts as well, I think. My guess is he just wrote a quick script that grabbed them all and didn't look at deprecated. Yeah. So when we allow this 
distributed chart search, have we talked about, we probably have, and I just can't remember, I wasn't present, uh, creating a new set of repos, like one for stable, one for incubator, one for depreciated, deprecated, and then maybe we can kind of clean those up as we move things into those new repos? We have not talked about what we will continue to own versus what will go elsewhere. Okay. Ideally, we would like the bulk of things to go elsewhere. Right. Uh, and we have we really just have not talked about what we're going to own. Yeah. After yeah, that. I feel like if we were to basically when we get that stuff in, lock this repo and create new ones, we can sort of make sure that they have an owner's file when they go in and be a little bit more uh, thoughtful of it. Um, kind of as a, as a reboot rather than going back and trying to clean up all of this. Um, yeah, I don't know. So one of the things um, that we could do, right? Because if we go from here and then we try to offload them and then as one is offloaded to a new location, deprecate it and then document the new location it's gone to. Mm -hmm. What we could say is if they're, who's going to own some of these things that maybe we would want to own is it appropriate for Helm to still own it? Or right. is there another place like Nginx Ingress? That's a big one, right? Everybody's using it. Do we still continue to own that as Helm? Or do we find a part of Kubernetes because Nginx Ingress is actually a Kubernetes project who would own that? And then maybe have a Kubernetes repo. And maybe some of us would just manage that over there or, or maybe some other folks, I don't know. I'm just thinking aloud of, what are the example cases of ones we would still want to own after the fact and can offload and then why and finding the appropriate home first. Uh, part of me says maintaining these things and even having the idea of a central repo um, makes me nervous because people will say, well, they're still doing it. So we should probably have clear criteria for anything that we still do documented criteria to help us make decisions rather than gut calls. Yeah, makes yeah. sense. But anything we do decide, yeah, totally. Owner's files, stuff like that. Okay. So from that discussion, it sounds to me like we should just put this in a like hold, hold and wait and see what happens. I, that's probably the easiest rather than doing the work to add them. There's a lot of legwork involved. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm not going to do it because I'm going to be off trying to get this distributed thing going here um, as soon as some of the Helm governance stuff uh, is done, which, by the way, for quick side reference, the governance PR is currently being voted on um, per the documented process for the uh, maintainers who need to vote on it. It's all documented in the provisional governance doc, but it is currently the long term. And if it passes, there'll be elections coming up here soon. Um, so once all that's done I'll probably kick over and put in a whole bunch of time helping Adnan and some others get this distributed thing up and going all right is there anything else we should talk about with owner's files we all right the last one then there the next one I threw on there was trusted users and okay to test when we moved out of the Kubernetes org, it meant that um, only collaborators or Helm uh, maintainers of some project uh, had the ability to now use OK to test. And so rather than having this massive group of users who could do it, the pool shrunk way down, right? If people could say OK to test because you have to be a repo collaborator or a member of the org. And it used to be all the members of the Kubernetes org could do it. And now it's just the members of the Helm org and then repo collaborators who are people who are listed in the owner's files. And that's it. So the pool really shrunk down and who can okay to test things. Uh, is there a thing where we wanted to say, you know what, you're not an, in an owner's file, you're not a chart owner, but you're tr we trust you, you're, you're cool. You can do okay to test and set a bar for that. Should we document and come up with some way to allow people to do that? We can just add them as a repo collaborator it's a pretty easy thing. Um, and so that way, as we deprecate all of that stuff, uh, they're, they're a repo collaborator, they can still do it, but it's compartmentalized to charts. What's the 
overarching reason to even still require it okay to test versus everything is okay to test? Ah, the reason for that is okay to test runs stuff on uh, our infrastructure, or I shouldn't say our infrastructure. Yeah, it's it's our and the CNCF Kubernetes infrastructure. I'm going to put it under one big bubble right now. And so basically, any chart, any container image, anything is going to run on our own custom infrastructure with the end-to-end -end testing. So we don't have timeouts. There's no timeouts in this infrastructure. If something can run for, for two days, doesn't matter. And a lot of this is because uh, Kubernetes itself is tested through a lot of these tools. And there are a lot of long running tests and custom situations where we need to, or Kubernetes has needed to do things because it's Prow and Kubernetes automation that enables this. And so where you go to a CI as a service, they put a lot of blockers on and say, you can only do this. We're sandboxing you all these certain ways. We don't actually have a lot of those um, security protocols in place uh, because Kubernetes has one of those short things or those long windows and, and things like that. And so the okay to test says, we haven't locked everything down here to let the world do it. Like somebody could do a pull request with a Bitcoin miner in it and it could run for weeks yeah. unless somebody checked it, right? Mm -hmm. we, we don't shut that stuff down. And so that okay to test says, we trust you not enough not to abuse that situation. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I didn't realize it was still uh, not quite that tied down with the long down, but long running stuff. Does that make sense? Um, do we just need to get better at us saying, like, instead of spending an hour doing reviews, I'm going to spend an hour just lightning fast going through uh, OK to test and just, like, get all that stuff done. It's kind of like a, you know. Sure. Before you've had your coffee versus after you've had your coffee. Where you are. I, yeah, I've done that done. before. I've done the that. Aren't quite all there, so you're not quite good to actually do real reviews. But it's good enough. You can probably look for Bitcoin miners. Yeah, I've done that before. Quite frankly, I've done that with them. Uh, it, this is about. There, there are some folks who've asked about this, saying I was trusted under Kubernetes. I'm not an owner. Is there a way for me to become trusted over here? And because they were trusted under Kubernetes, um, and because they've been in good faith acting here, I'm. I'm kind of okay adding some trust thing. I just want to document it so people know what it means. Yeah, and as long as our criteria for who we trust is written down somewhere, it makes sense. That sounds good to me. Can we are we able to say like anyone that has certain membership to just the Kubernetes org in general has that access again programmatically, or is it something we would need to add as members of our org separately? We, we would have to need add those collaborators to the repo. Yeah, yeah we, we would have to do that. Um, is there a way to programmatically figure out who those folks are? It would be a changing list, so we'd need a tool that could yeah. do it. Um, Maybe I'm not sure if it's worthwhile in the short term if they yeah, could. No, I agree. If they if they make their Kubernetes membership public. And we could just go look at their profile and verify it. Uh, did anybody want to take a thing to try to come up with the draft process uh, to do to to do a PR on this, and then we can review it and talk about it? Darn, no takers. All right, I'll do it. I'm big on governance lately, so why the heck not? If I'm if my brain's in that space, I can take a, a shot at writing a PR on this. All right. Uh, Matt, I can I can help a bit. Um, I'm this is Scott. I'm finally on, <laughs> um, but I I joined partway through this conversation, so I feel like I'm missing some context. So maybe just if if you want to or someone wants to ping me later, I can tag team some of it. Sure. Yeah, we're talking about documenting the the trust process to become a person who can do an OK to test on the charts repo. Maybe they had that with ah, Kubernetes. Uh, I see. And so that's that's the thing, and it's just kind of documenting that and then discussing it. I, I have an idea because this is a pretty simple one how we could document that, sure. um, and then discuss it. So I think I can go spend twenty minutes writing a PR on this and then just ping everyone, and you can all tell me where I'm wrong and how we should revise it. <laughs> all right, then the Bitnami bot updating charts every day. Who put this one in? Uh, yeah, I put this one in. Uh, so the Bitnami containers are built, rebuilt every day on top of. Um, 
uh, our Ubuntu base. Okay. And right now we're not updating the charts every day because that would mean an insane amount of PRs. Yeah. Um, but we would like to, so that we always have the, the kind of freshest image in the charts. And I was just wondering, you know, how is, is there a way we could make that possible and not be insane? I have a terrific idea. I have a wonderful idea. Let's go build up the distributed charts. Then you have your own repository of Bitnami charts and the Bitnami bot can update them every single day. <laughs> well, and so we, you are an example case of how to do this. So we actually are doing that in our, in our own repo today. Um, but okay. there's, obviously there's, there's a couple in the, in the upstream repo that, that we'd like to do yeah. for as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so so let's think about ways we could do this. I mean, basically, the way we would have to do it is the Bitnami bot would just have commit access to master, roughly, right? That could be one way, yeah. Or if there's a way to kind of auto merge the PRs from Bitnami bot, I don't know. The way we would have to do that is something that could, for them to automatically be marched as merged, they'd need the looks good to me and they'd need approved labels added to them automatically. And then they could just be marked for auto merge. So we would need something that could parse and say, oh, this is from Bitnami bot, we could do that. But then it also opens a policy discussion on what forms of automation could do this because Bitnami bot is a fantastic example of one that does this stuff well. I mean, quite frankly, if you wanna get your reviewer stats up in an easy way, just review Bitnami bot. Looks good to me, Does that's easy, it's cake ones. Um, because it does a good job, it's predictable, stuff tends to work, right? Um, if we were gonna go do this, we'd have to come up with some kind of policy so that it's not just a one-off with Bitnami bot, but it's something that others could do as well. Um, right? I guess. Maybe, Maybe a, a, trust, a trust history or something, a certain amount of that. Because that's really why we, why it would be hard to not feel comfortable with the Benami bot, right? Is it's literally never made a mistake with this, right? But as part of the CNCF, we also need to um, make sure that we don't prioritize any one company or organization over anybody else, right? And that, that's right. The big, that's I think that's why I meant I said trust history. Like, for instance, um, I, I, I mean, that, that's, um, I don't know, some type of an idea of, of working toward a policy. Yeah. You know, if, there, um, if there's a history of, a, of I don't know, um, hmm, or a vote. Yeah. What, what do you suggest? I haven't really come across this before. So we, we could have a file kind of similar to owners that would that would list kind of like a whitelist of certain uh, accounts that would be able to, that we can auto merge. But I... The how I think is the easy part, quite frankly, writing a tool that said, okay, this one's good, we can do this. Mm -hmm. It's the what, what makes Bitnami bot trustable? Because we can't just say, well, Bitnami is in this bot and do this, because then we're just prioritizing one company. We probably need a policy in place that any bot or any automation is capable of meeting and Bitnami bot meets it. So therefore we put that in and it probably will be the only one to ever meet it unless another bot can come along and meet the criteria before charts is deprecated. Um, but that also means that, I mean, quite frankly, that means massive incrementing because there's, there's a thing in the other side for the consumers because they are going to get every single day there'll be a new version of the charts out. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's a policy thing on the one end and then there's a user experience on the consuming side because every day you're getting a new version of the chart, right? Mm -hmm. And that's our policy of always incrementing. Y'all may only cut releases, say, once a week with your stuff when you run your own repository, but the way ours work also causes that kind of problem. So next thing you know, the release yeah. is going to become astronomically high. That's true. Yeah. Um, and, and Adnan, I thought about this before, specifically about the Bitnami tags, because you do something um, not completely unique, but a little bit special with the rolling releases. Yeah. And that's um, kind of what we, yeah. we actually want to get away from the, the rolling releases because they've, they've caused other issues where, you know, things 
uh, have been unexpectedly. So one one of the issues with with uh, with that is you don't actually know what what container image you, you'll be running when you install a chart um, if if you use the rolling releases because you know if that pod restarts yeah. and, and and your image pool policy is always you're going to get an updated image that you might not expect, um, which is really bad for production use cases. You don't want yeah, to or you'd have to have a way to do a Docker pull on that, you know, short tag. Um, yeah. So that's why we kind of want to move to having explicit tags. Um, but currently, that would mean, us, you know, updating every day. The chart version thing is a, is a good point. I don't know if we are always bumping the chart version in our in the uh, in the Bidami repo. I can look into that. Yeah. Yeah. If we, if we do that, then it shouldn't update on people willy nilly. And like like yeah. Well, Unless, it's more like you said we do. If, Yes. If you use the rolling ta tag, um, and you know that gets rebuilt yes, yes. when you first launch it, in, uh, you know when um, you're right. Yeah, that wouldn't that's, be a that's good idea. idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, and for our repo, because we increment the chart versions on every go, if we kind of made an exception to that, now it's a new policy, new complication, all kinds of tooling needs to be updated to handle these situations, so it passes CI, right? I, yeah, I don't think our, I don't think we we no, I agree. Do that either. Yeah. Just, just forget what I forget what I said. In, in fact, it goes against the policy of charts being in, immutable because those short tags are immutable by definition. So, so Benami Bot will only handle yeah. updates that are trivial. So things things that are essentially you know patch version updates. Anything that's minor or major is is done yeah. manually. Um, so I, I don't know it's that it's terrible for that patch version to to keep increasing. Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, in a day that would be like every day that would be quite a lot. But I, but if you're focusing on that, the minor and major, it might be, it might I mean, not be too bad. You're, you're talking perfectly patch accessible to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, Simper is Simper is perfectly acceptable to have patch versions in the hundreds or thousands, even. You know, um, mm -hmm. there's no reason not that you you know, if it were every day once a day, then yeah, it would be in the hundreds, uh, which would probably be fine. So uh, think about somebody taking one of these things, so a consumer's experience, not what a spec allows, but a consumer's experience. So somebody has tooling that checks for updates every day, right? And then now has to go say, oh, there was a change. I'm going to go automatically update this. Now you're updating your running version every day. Now also take into index.yaml file growth, right? Remember that index v1 also has, well, performance limitations on growth, quite frankly. It's the reason we're iterating on a second version of the spec for Helm 3, because stuff can just totally explode. So in a year, you can have 365 <laughs> new revisions just on patch versions, right? Think about how big your yeah. index.yaml file is going to grow, which is really going to cost a problem with V1 spec. That's per chart. And that's per chart. And so, I mean, with the, with the so many, we're talking thousands of new versions automatically added every year to our index.yaml file, which is a V1 index.yaml file, which is going to start to be noticeable for everybody. So that's across yeah, the board yeah. user experience problem. Yeah, that is a good point. Right. I mean, if we were just cutting releases on these things like once a week, that would be a huge difference or once every whatever, however often. But that's that, that this ends up being a UX experience with the a performance slowdowns because Helm's going to start slowing down whenever you add a repo for everybody. If we do this, I hate to say the more that you're saying this, I, I kind of like what you said in the first place, uh, Matt. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Benami charts are the ideal charts to 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 add to the new hub first because you already. I mean, Adnan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you already have a good idea of how to do that because you run your own monocular instance for Benami, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be oh, kind of yeah. the, the great, a great uh, boilerplate for other charts. 
Yeah. And the way you have automation on top of it that can check for changes and updates and regenerate stuff, that's a great bouncing point to tell people, here's other things you can do. Yeah. And I only say that uh, after the index uh, issue because, you know, once they'll, they won't be sharing the index file with all the other charts. So th whatever pain point it would cause would be lower, even, you know, even if you were thinking about trying to make things easy on the, the end user still, you know, um, and, it and would eventually be a index file. Yeah. And Helm 3 will be coming along soon enough, which will mitigate a lot of this pain. I mean, right. quite frankly, I, when I was doing testing for that version two, I was doing things where the number of versions for a chart was like 5,000 different versions on a chart when I was looking at memory footprint and stuff. So I was going for this DevOps model just in case where you would have thousands of increments and what would your, your uh, index grow like for an individual chart just based on that. Because I figure some folks will do CI where they're always pushing and this number just continues to grow. So, so Helm Free is still a single index, but it's JSON instead of YAML. Is that correct? No. It's so Helm 3, we haven't implemented it yet, but the spec is documented is you're going to have an index file that will hold all of the charts in the repository and their latest version, just the latest. Okay. And then every single chart will have its own JSON file that contains a list of all versions. Uh, interesting. Okay. That makes sense. And then you can do neat things such as when you do things like Helm install and point it at a URL, like you can do that now, but you got to have the TGZ file on it. Um, we can actually do other things such as uh, not put the dot TGZ and maybe say, here's the chart and then do something like at this version. And then you could actually pass in a version range and it could figure it out. Right. And you can install from a URL that way even. Uh, because you don't have to fetch the whole index and download it to figure out the version. You could just fetch the, the file for the individual chart. It actually makes this process a little bit smoother from what we have That's today. So it has tools for that. It also gives us tools to do things like, um, or, you know, I, I won't go on, but it, it, that, that was the reason for some of this. Is it, let's, and you can also do things like for when we do this uh, distributed search, if we wanted to have an index file of lots of things in this that you could do, right? You could actually re regurgitate the index file, but when you point to individual charts in it, you could point to their home repository locations. It gives us flexibility in having an index file that points to charts and stuff in entirely different locations, but still having a roll up because it could be a relative path or it could be an absolute path to someplace else. Okay. There, was, there were some ideas given to this to give us some flexibility in the future for doing roll up indexes and stuff like that. Don't know what we'll do with it yet, but the capability is there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so other ways that we could kind of go around this is, um, so obviously one way is to keep what, what we're doing right now, which is using the rolling tags. I don't, although we have had, we have seen issues with that. So uh, if, if we could get away with that, that'd be better. So one other way would be instead of updating charts every day, we could, we could do it on a schedule, say every week or something. Um, so it won't be the, the, the freshest, but you know, it'd be the freshest every Monday or something. Um, and that wouldn't be necessarily too terrible. Um, they would still have to go through the review process, I guess. And everything, but that would just be it. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do something like that, I would suggest maybe putting it on a Wednesday because you don't usually have them coming in on, um, you know, no holidays tend to be on a Monday or a Friday. And yeah. a Friday would be a bad time to cut a release, right? Along with Monday before a lot of people are in and mentally with it for the week. Lots of times Wednesday is the best day for cutting these kinds of things. So if there were a rolling thing coming in on Wednesday, I think that would be fantastic. It would be easy to manually review or whatnot. Um, and, and I'm totally cool with coming up with a policy that Bitnami bot could maybe do some of this on its own without having to go through the review process. So Adnan, if you wanted to maybe propose something um, on it and then we could iterate on it and talk about it, I think that would be fantastic because I'm, I'm okay with giving automation a little bit more power if it's doing very simple patch version changes, um, especially 
you know, given things like a proven track record and stuff like that. So if there was some policy written up um, that Bitnami bot and maybe even others could fit, I think that could be cool. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Where's the right place to to propose that? Is in the Charles repo or community Probably. repo? Probably. I I haven't thought that far. <laughs> what about the contributing doc? You know, just a proposal in the form of a PR to that. Yeah. Okay. That could be. Yeah. There you go. For for automation. Um, that would like to, to do think contribute things directly without having to go through the process. Here's the criteria. Right. If you would like to be on, if you would like your automation bot or app to be on a white list for patch for, you know, patch versions only, here's the yeah. Yeah, criteria. Mm -hmm. We need to be strict. I mean, it can't be something easy that lots of bots can get into because there has right. to be a certain amount of trust factor there and trust factor with the organization yep. and the bot, because if somebody changes the bot to do something bad, right, that's not a good thing either. Yep. And so we, we yep. definitely need a strict policy, but yeah, Adnan, if you want to propose something, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I can do that. Cool. All right. Let's see. Where's that? We should add. Oh, somebody added it. Okay. I think we're good. Um, are we good on this one, Adnan, with the Bitnami bot stuff? Is there anything else you wanted to talk about with it today? Uh, yeah, I think no. I think that covers it. Yeah. Uh, unless Beltran, was there anything you wanted to add? Okay. Um, Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, all right. Um, and you like how I volunteered you for that? Thank you for handling that so well. <laughs> I feel like that one's only, only fair. Yeah. Uh, all right. So um, that's all we have for the discussion topics. We've got about 10 minutes left. Is there anything anybody else wanted to bring up or discuss in these final few minutes? Or is that it? Uh, so I have a quick question around how strict we care about sender because i see tons of pull requests that are just bumping the patch release but there is you know definitely some changing functionality um but often it's very minor so the way we've been viewing it and and folks add on to this here is um it's about the public API to the chart, which tends to be the values file. Things behind it can change, but when we talk about uh, stuff like that, it's the values files. Now, um, I would say we wanna be strict on Semver to an extent, right? So if you add new functionality and the chart version is 1.4, you'd want it to be 1.5. Mm -hmm. The problem comes in is there's a whole bunch of charts with zero dot something versions. And when you're at a zero dot version, 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 is considered a breaking API change because it acts differently when you're below one. And that's where we run into a problem uh, because a lot of charts but, but also, are adding Matt, functionality to zero dots. Yeah, that's right. Um, but also Matt, uh, there was the other conversation we had last week about charts and stable that are still in, that are still in a dev version. And if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought the result of that was that we should, from this point forward, be moving those charts, those those stable charts to non-dev versions, if we can, like when we get a chance. To actually release, like if they're in stable, they should be at least be one dot something, right? Yeah. So, so just to be, I mean, I was going to go through and just whole cloth to do that for all of them, but I figured, well, that's what we want to do. So while we're at it, we might as well just on new PRs do that rather than open a slew of new ones, you know? According to the, the uh, and, and, spec, oh, sorry, go ahead, Scott. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I was just reading the, the, the Samba spec and it says, if the major version is zero, then any change, whether patch or minor, is considered the breaking change. So, yeah, I would agree. I think we probably want to move as many chances as we can to a, to a stable version. Yeah, and 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 I guess the question that I would have is if if they're not if they're still in dev versions, why are they unstable ultimately? 
Um, I mean, to, I, I would almost feel like what you were just, what you both just said would apply or should ideally apply to things in incubator, but once they're stable, they should go to 1.0 or above. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, maybe this is something. Um, oh, just... and then also, no, go ahead. Dang, sorry about my connection. No worries. Uh, um, I was just gonna say maybe it's something we can ask for in PRs that people just bump this to a a one zero. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did that in a PR the other day for the first time after our call, and it seemed to work pretty well. I just explained that, and the person was like, "Oh, okay." Um, and I should also note that I think. It, it, people have charts maintainers have bumped versions for contributors as well, which I think has helped a lot because you're not really at that point you're adding commits, but you're not really adding, um, you're not really changing their work. You're just helping the process along. Um, so if there are you know if there are PRs that are just languishing because you know a person's not checking regularly and then they keep getting out of sync with the version bumping, we could just do that for them if it's ready to go and just get cleared out of the way. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question because often when I've told people to rebase or fix their version, you know, it sits for weeks, if not forever. So if we are okay with us just going in and doing it, um, I know we've the done time it, it would half. be easier for me to just do it than to tell someone to do it. Yeah, does anyone have a problem with that? I, I, I know we've it's been done in the past and it, it seems okay to me. But I, um, any other thoughts? And then on that, if someone has a preferred way to cleanly add to another person's commits in Git, because I would imagine you'd be having to like fork their fork, edit it, and then push it up, or you uh, can, or you, I think actually no, you can check out like a. A pull request via some ref magic, right? So, so the, the way most folks have been doing this is, uh, if you are one of the repo owners, um, you should have access to go edit the code in any PR. Right. Uh, and so you, that means and most of us do it through the UI. Is you yeah. can actually go into the UI and you can click the little edit button and it'll GitHub will take you right there and you can go make individual file changes and commit it and do all of that right through the UI. That's where it's typically been done. You can do it from the command line with uh, proper access. I haven't done it that way. I'm lazy. I always do it through the UI. But if you are one of the repo owners, you are capable of making those changes and that's why we're able to bump the version. Ah, okay, cool. I'll have to play around and, with the UI. Yeah, if is you it, don't have that access yet, let us know because I think Adnan added yeah, you to that. Yeah, I think I, I think I do have that access. But I guess the the who opens the PR needs to check the allows commits from maintainers. If he's unchecked, that is you cannot do that. I guess that's true. I think it's checked by default. Yeah, it's checked, checked by default. default but checked the, by default for this repo. Yeah. yeah, if they uncheck it, then we lose that access. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Is there a way to I guess doing that would also fix most rebase issues because most of those are around a version number as well. So, okay. I and will, you can uh, fix rebase issues through there. There's actually a button to fix if it, there's a merge conflict. There's a button in the UI in those now that you can click it and you can walk through and you can actually rebase and fix this right in the browser. And then you just walk through and you confirm each file after you've changed it. You can do it right in the UI. Okay, cool. Next time I do a review run, I will uh, test out that functionality cool. and yeah. yell and scream. The and only caveat. It work. Oops, sorry. The only caveat I want to mention is that um, now that we are requiring sign commits, you can you can just instead of using the S flag, you have to actually you know paste in that line in your commit message when you do it through the UI. Gotcha. By the way, guys, I'm really sorry about my connection. I feel like I keep stepping on people. I will try not to do that. That's, so good. That's quite all right. Okay. Uh, I documented some notes on this, um, but I think we've, we've got a kind of a general direction. Uh, and, and we're two minutes to time.
So I just wanted to be cognizant of that. Is there much more we wanted to talk about with this? Nope, I think we covered it. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, I guess we used up, I didn't expect us to use up the whole hour and we did today. So thanks everyone for coming and for participating. I think this was a great meeting. Um, uh, one quickie if I can. Um, sure. I have ended up as an essay at Mesosphere and guess whose team I am on? A guy that I think several of you know, a fellow named Jared Dillon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's yeah, there, one, of the old, one of the original guys at Deus apparently. So. Cool. Oh, cool. Congratulations. I didn't realize he was there. Yeah. That's where he ended up. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, with that then, folks, have a wonderful week, and we will see you on the internet. Good job. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.